Welcome to the ISG's quarterly call summarizing the second quarter of 2017. My name is Howard Coleman. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Coldstream. And with me today is Darren Ritchie, the Portfolio Manager for Joe Cervantes' team. I will be providing a market recap and Darren will be presenting the special, pro the special topic which for this call is factors that influence markets. While we have scheduled this call for 30 minutes, please bear with us if the call runs over a bit so that we can cover these topics for you. Now for the market recap. Um, it's been a very strong year in the equity markets. Uh, the second quarter as a whole was not quite as strong as the first quarter, but there were strong returns in the second quarter as well. As you can see, the S&P was up uh, three point, a little over 3% for the second quarter and year to date almost 12%. As you can see as well, in 2016 for the entire year it was up 12%. So uh, it's been a very nice first six months. Uh, you might assume from the fact that it was up similar amounts that the market has been steadily chugging along. Uh, while that's true as a whole, it's not true when you evaluate individual sectors. Leadership of the market has significantly changed from last year and, and we'll discuss this a bit later on. Uh, the NASDAQ, you can see, is, is up stronger than the S&P year-to-date in 19.82%. Um, tech has had a very strong rally earlier in the year, um, and it was up 4% uh, in the second quarter. As you can see, it lagged a bit in 2016. Um, it lagged a bit in 2016, and it lagged a bit after the election. In part, um, it lagged because of the Trump trade, and we'll discuss that a little bit uh, in a little bit more depth in a few minutes as well. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Russell 2000, I'm skipping down, uh, is small cap U.S. equities, and that has significantly trailed year to date. Still a nice return, 7.63%, but it had an extremely strong 2016, up 21.28%. In large part, the Russell was up strong. Uh, uh, last year, as was, uh, as was, um, excuse me, as was, well, tech this year, but the Russell was up strong last year, in large part because of the Trump trade, in large part because folks felt that there, there may be some tariffs, there may be some trade wars going on, and small cap U.S. stocks being focused on the domestic economy would rally strongly. Um, at, in addition, um, those companies would significantly benefit from tax cuts. So the Trump agenda truly drove small caps to outperform. As concerns arose about the implementation of the Trump agenda, uh, they fell off this year. Um, in exact opposite nature, the EFI, uh, which is international developed markets, uh, Europe, Asia, and, and the Europe, Australia, Far East, uh, was up 1% in 2016. It lagged significantly. This year it's had very strong returns, up 16.4%. Uh, those returns really in many ways are due to fundamentals. Uh, Europe is, is they say, about two or three years behind the U.S. in recovery, and we are really starting to see improvements in GDP and some inflation. So this is really um, a fundamental issue as much as it is a, you know, a political issue which was a driver of markets in many ways in the U.S. In addition, uh, we'll see in a few minutes how the dollar has weakened this year and that has helped European stocks, which of course are denominated in the foreign currency. So when you convert it back to U.S. terms, um, it improves, it improves the, the return. Uh, and, and emerging markets have had a very strong year as well. Uh, bonds, the Barclays Ag, which is really U.S. government bonds and Agency mortgages, government-backed agency mortgages, very safe paper, um, very mediocre year, lagging again. Uh, you'll never see these have very, very strong returns, but it's been very muted. Uh, international bonds have been significantly better, 7.67%, but again, a large part of this is the weakening of the U.S. dollar, and that has really helped bond returns as the, as the uh, currency in which those bonds pay interest has strengthened against the U.S., magnifying the effect in U.S. dollars. The high-yield bond market continues to chug along at a very nice 6% after a very strong 17% last year. 
Uh, commodities have been the one headwind. Uh, we know that oil has had some issues. Av had many other commodities. And here's a chart of the S&P. Um, as we can see, right after the election in 2017, we had a very strong run in the S&P. Uh, it has it leveled off significantly, again, as concerns about growth and the Trump trade uh, tailed off. Initially, the Trump agenda was as seen as a very pro-growth agenda economically, um, but as it has had significant headwinds in implementation, the market cool to it. Uh, recently, we've seen another nice strong run up in the market. But again, as I mentioned, leadership has changed and we'll talk about that in a second. And here we see one of the prime examples of how leadership has changed and this is financials. Uh, financial stocks had a significant run and these are value stocks. It had a significant run after the election. Um, people thought that growth, uh, the, the pro-growth agenda plus a deregulatory environment for banks would be a great tailwind for banks. And they rallied very, very strong after the election. This year, they have trailed significantly from the rest of the market. And similarly, uh, growth versus value. Um, as you, The red line here is growth stocks. The dark line is value stocks. And you can see after the election, value stocks rallied strongly and banks were a big component of, of, of that. This year, it has switched dramatically to growth and the chart on the left shows the relationship since the election. The chart on the right shows what's happened year to date. So year to date, growth has dramatically outperformed value and a lot of that has been in technology. A lot of that has been in the FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Um, large cap tech stocks have significantly rallied uh, as they were a little bit muted for the Trump trade because they sell internationally significantly um, and there were some concerns about, as I mentioned, um, tariffs and trade war. Now that that has seemed to have gone away, these stocks have rallied very, very hard. Um, valuations um, are rich. Um, the valuations have the blue line here is um, trailing earnings and the orange line is forward earnings. So this is what the price to earnings ratio is based on trailing earnings and forward earnings. And as you can see, it's 19.8 uh, for trailing and 17.9 for futures. Um, that has remained relatively constant, but the market has significantly run. Now, I must point out that in the gray area, which shows the market returns, a lot of the run has happened at the after the end of the third quarter in the month of July. Um, so these valuations are historically high, uh, but in compared to where the market has run, uh, they are getting they are getting fairly rich. But we all know historically that valuations can remain elevated for a significant period of time. One of the interesting things that I thought would be uh, of interest to note is the change in the S&P over time. We, we, we think of it as one index, but the components of the index are dramatically different over time. Remember, the S&P is market cap weighted, so the largest companies have the largest impact on S&P's returns. And we can see, for example, in 2001, that GE, Microsoft, Exxon, Citi, and Walmart were the five leading drivers of the S&P. In 2011, as recently as 2011, only a Apple was the only tech company uh, out of the top five. Today, it's all tech. It's Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. And so the composition of the S&P and what it looks like uh, is, is very different now, the leadership of it, than it was historically. Um, here's a chart of the NASDAQ, and as we can see, um, initially, uh, the tech names also dominate the NASDAQ, although it is not completely tech. It's a misnomer that people think it's completely tech. It's not, but it is dominant tech. Um, again, this, this was relatively muted compared to the S&P last year. But since this year, that just reflects the growth curve increasing. And that is where the, where the leadership has lied. 
Um, this is EFI, this is International Developed Markets, and it really has been a straight line up this year after significant lagging. If, if we look back to the left of the chart, which is 2014, we really see that before, you know, as of mid-year last year, it actually had lost money uh, from 2014. As, as Europe was in the doldrums, uh, deflation was on the horizon, bond yields were negative, and people thought Europe was a long way from a significant recovery. That has changed, and the market has rallied strong. And this is relative performance, and this is very interesting, between U.S. stocks and international stocks, between the S&P and the EFI. And the, the solid red line is what's called two standard deviations. The dotted red line is one standard deviation. U.S. stocks have outperformed international stocks by more than two standard deviations. In other words, more than 98% of the time has U.S. stocks outperformed international stocks. Um, more than 98%, we are in the 98th plus percentile of U.S. stocks outperforming international stocks at this period. So uh, if, mean, if things revert back to the mean, which they don't always do, and certainly not immediately, you would suspect international stocks to outperform U.S. in the near future. Emerging markets, um, a similar story. Uh, they fell off significantly between 2014 and the middle of 2015, but have rallied significantly since then, again on growth prospects. I mentioned the dollar, and the dollar has a significant influence in uh, U.S. companies, feasibility abroad, because the less, the cheaper the dollar, the cheaper U.S. goods, and a becomes a tailwind in the back of U.S. companies. A stronger dollar uh, provides somewhat of a tailwind for European companies selling into the U.S. Excuse me, a weaker dollar provides... No, it's just right. The stronger dollar provides a tailwind. Excuse me, I was right the first time. Stronger dollar provides a tailwind for European companies selling into the U.S. because their goods are cheaper. Um, the, the falling dollar here will provide a headwind, um, the falling dollar will provide a headwind for U.S. companies uh, selling abroad. And uh, it is a source of optimism, it may be a tailwind, uh, a headwind in front of uh, European companies. Uh, this has been remarkably unusual. Um, this is market volatility. The VIX is a measure of volatility in markets. and. The VIX has been, this is historically low with the VIX below 10. Uh, technically it means it's, it's a measure of the option market and the volatility in the option market and below 10 really means the market's prediction within about a year, uh, within one standard deviation about 65% of the time, the market is predicting that the movement in the S&P will be less than 10% up or down over the next year. It's uh, just to give you by context, in 2008, at the, at the height of the crisis, the VIX was at 80, uh, predicting potentially 80% movements. So this is historically calm. And the reasons behind this um, are probably a couple things, although no one knows for sure. Number one, the rise of the ETFs, so that stocks are traded as a basket, not individually. And secondly, that economic metrics have been relatively stable. Inflation and growth, has there's been no big surprises in those economic metrics, and most probably, while well, no one knows for sure, those seem to be the things driving the calmness of the VIX. Um, the 10-year yield, and this is where we kind of switch to discuss the Fed a bit. Um, the 10-year yield is a good indication of the market's perception of future growth, and we've been, dis, uh, we've been in a very slow growth environment. We continue to be in a slow growth environment, and the bond market is continuing to predict a slow growth environment. Uh, today, the 10-year yields is about 2.3%, right within a trading range that has existed since the election. You can see at the time of the election, yields shot up as people thought growth would improve. Uh, that has come off, and we are in a, in a tight trading range, really forecasting moderate growth. Uh, here is a, another significant conundrum, something that um, you don't usually see. The, the blue line is unemployment, but it's reversed. 
So the higher the blue line, the less the unemployment. The black line is earnings. Historically and typically you think when the unemployment rate falls, earnings rise uh, because supply and demand. It's less of a labor force. They can demand more for wages. And you want, at this point in the cycle right now, we want earnings to rise. We need some inflation. And of course, we need to kind of close the economic disparity that people have been discussing. It hasn't happened. And it's a conundrum as to why it hasn't happened. Um, the, his, the story for years was that uh, Asia, and specifically China, is exporting deflation. And what that means really is that the workers in China are so much cheaper than the workers in the U.S. and the workers in Asia that they were keeping a lid on wages. Now, the problem with that argument now is that, that that's happened for many, many years, and that should be built in. So, so there still should be some change in earnings. Uh, given that that is built into the equation, but there hasn't, and this has been a significant conundrum for the Fed. Uh, I'm going to close here um, with a, a unique situation, and this is the T-bill spread, government T-bills for six months minus three months. And typically, as Darren will discuss in more detail in his section, you're going to get more of a yield for six months than you are for three months. The longer out, the higher the return because there's slightly more risk in the time value of money, so you're, you're expected to get some higher return. Um, and that's historically been true. Right now, three-month T-bills, the yield you get on three-month T-bills is higher than the yield you get on six-month T-bills, and that is specifically because of concern about in three months what happens. You're going to need the debt ceiling vote and the possibility of a government shutdown, and the market is showing some jitters about the possibility of um, we do not believe there's a recession ahead. Um, the conference board's leading economic indicators, uh, which are a group of indicators that uh, predict the economy, some are based on economic fundamentals, some are based on sentiment, and some are based on market. But they are, as you can see from this chart, the gray line equals a recession. The blue line equals where the economic uh, indicators are. It is about a six month or so lag uh, when the economic indicators roll over before we roll into a recession. And economic indicators have not rolled over. We do not see a recession in sight uh, and we do, and recessions, bear markets come with recessions, so we do not see a bear market. That's not saying that there is not a possibility of a correction on the horizon, but there is clearly um, there's not a, a recession currently on the horizon. Uh, the final point, and, and we preach this at Coldstream constantly, and I, those of you who know us well know that this is an important part of our mantra, and that is the importance of diversification. Um, the green line shows the returns of stocks and bonds over one-year periods, five-year rolling, 10-year rolling, and a 20-year rolling. Uh, the blue line is bonds, and the gray line is a 50-50 portfolio of stocks and bonds. And you can see that with a diversified portfolio, you don't have the drawdowns that you do in a st all stock portfolio. You may not have quite the upside over time, but you come pretty close with significantly less volatility. You have greater returns with bonds, you have a little bit more volatility, but not significant. So in the long run, a diversified portfolio will may not perform in the short run, but on a risk-adjusted basis will perform in the long run. And now I'll turn the, the presentation over to Darren Ritchie. Um, thank you for your attention. Go ahead, Darren. Thank you, Howard, and uh, thank all of you for attending uh, today's webinar as well. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about factors that influence markets, uh, in particular on the stock and the bond side. What are the drivers of risk and return in these various asset classes that we're invested in? We tend to talk about this a lot in financial lingo. We, we discuss that a lot internally, but we wanted to share some of those factors with you uh, so that maybe they can help inform our future discussions. Uh, moving forward. Uh, let's take a look at what various investments have done over time in terms of risk and return. Uh, Ibbotson Associates has put together data series that go all the way back to 1926 on a variety of asset classes. So these give us very good long-term data about how we can expect uh, various categories to perform. 
And this measure is a, is a scatter plot. It shows risk in terms of standard deviation, a measure that Howard mentioned earlier on the, uh, the bottom axis. And on the vertical axis, you can see the average return over time again since 1926. Uh, your lowest risk return option is usually some form of cash, and we can use three-month treasury bills as a proxy for cash. So these earn you a little more than 3% over time with, with minimal volatility. Stepping up the risk curve, we can look at intermediate-term treasury bonds, uh, say a 10-year treasury bond. Uh, Long-term corporate bonds, a little bit riskier, a little bit more return. And high-yield corporate bonds, uh, similarly, a little bit stepping up the risk curve. Moving a little higher still, we have large U.S. stocks like the S&P 500. And finally, U.S. small and mid-cap stocks are the riskiest return over time with considerably more volatility than large stocks have, but they also have the highest return. The red line that connects the, uh, the treasury bills and the small cap stocks represents the most efficient for, uh, portfolio for any given mix of assets. So, for example, you're trying to maximize the return for a given level of risk by blending these various assets. Uh, so you can see that uh, you can improve your risk-reward trade-off through diversification by blending some of these asset classes at any given level of risk. Uh, this is purely backward-looking, but it gives an idea of how you can construct a portfolio, a diversified portfolio that's uh, in theory better than any single asset class. But why is this relationship? Uh, uh, why does this relationship appear uh, this way? Why do you get more return per unit of risk? I think it's intuitive, but let's step into the factors that drive that relationship. And we'll start on the bond side. Uh, before we dive into the bond side, one, one uh, phenomenon that we often talk about is that bond yields and bond prices move in opposite directions. And this is something that financial professionals will, will talk about very quickly, but it's not all that intuitive. You might think that, okay, if I can get a higher yield on a bond, wouldn't I pay more for that? Wouldn't it be more valuable? Uh, so this is a relationship that I think maybe we should spend a moment unpacking before we move forward. So let's say you're, you're a bond investor and you're buying a Microsoft corporate bond, uh, a 10-year bond uh, with a $100 face value that pays you a 4% coupon. So every year you're going to get $4 in interest on the $100 you paid for it, uh, generates a 4% yield. Um, uh, and at the end of that 10-year term, you'll get back that original $100 face value that you paid for the bond, uh, and then you can buy another one if you so choose. Uh, so let's, let's play with that price a little bit. You paid $100 for it, but let's say that uh, the market decides that they want to buy more Microsoft bonds and they bid up the price of Microsoft bonds. Or maybe people get more, uh, more willing to take stock risk and they sell their Microsoft bonds to buy stocks. So let's take those two cases where the price of the bond goes up or goes down. Uh, so in those cases, uh, we can see that the $4 coupon stays the same. You still own the same bond with the same interest payment, but you're changing the market price of that bond. So in the case of the price going up, your $4 coupon gets divided by a $105 price, meaning that the yield falls to 3.81%. Uh, on the other side, if people are selling those bonds and the price falls, the $4 coupon is divided by a smaller price and you get a yield increase. Uh, so there immediately we can see that as the price of the bond goes up, the yield goes down and vice versa. But that's actually not the end of the story for the bond market. There's a complicating factor which is the fact that you still get that $100 face value back at the end of the 10-year term of the bond, regardless of what you actually paid for it. So if you pay $105 for the bond, but you only get $100 back at the end, your yield actually falls a little bit more. Uh, on the other side, if you paid $95 and you get back $100 after 10 years, your yield goes up a little bit more. And that concept is called yield to maturity. It's a little bit more uh, complicated, complicated of a calculation than the simple yield, which is your interest payment divided by your current price. But it also moves in the same direction, just a little bit more so. Uh, and you'll often see on our statements, we might describe yield to maturity of a particular bond, which includes not only that current interest payment, but the return of principal when the bond matures at the end of its term. Uh, so hopefully this helps uh, illustrate how bond prices and yields move in, in opposite directions. And as we'll see, that yield could move for multiple reasons, and we want to dive into some of those reasons now. Uh, so why do bonds pay interest? Well, you know, I think that's a, a pretty, uh, pretty simple concept, at least at first, which is that if you're going to induce people to give you money, you have to pay them a return, uh, uh, whether it's to a, a savings account, to a corporate bond, a treasury bond, any other kind of loan, which is essentially what a bond is. You need to be compensated for the fact that you are surrendering, surrendering your money to somebody else so they can use it in the meantime until they give it back to you at the end of that bond or at the end of that loan. Even if you knew that you were with perfect certainty going to get your money back at the end of that loan, uh, you still want to be compensated for the loss of the use of it over time. In fact, one term for interest is usury, 
typically it's associated with a, an egregiously high level of interest, but originally it meant the compensation that you get for letting somebody else use your money. Uh, so that's where the term usury comes from. And we call that the risk-free rate in finance, the, the rate on a purely um, a guaranteed bond over time uh, still has a positive rate of interest in most cases. But there are other factors that we should look at as well. Uh, one of them uh, is called the inflation risk premium. So in an environment where investors expect inflation, they, don't, they not only want to get that, uh, that risk-free rate paid to them, they also want compensation for the inflation that they expect over the life of the bond. And expected inflation is responsible for a large part of the variations we see in interest rates over time. So for example, if we look at historical inflation, this is the consumer price index over time, you can see that inflation has varied pretty widely. And in fact, over, um, uh, over the, the period from 1970 to 1980, we had rapidly rising inflation. And you might remember if you were an investor or, or getting a mortgage at that time, uh, that, uh, that interest rates in the early 80s, late 70s were in double digits in most cases. And that's not just because interest rates alone were high, it's because inflation was very high in that period and lenders wanted compensation uh, uh, for the inflation risk that they were bearing. So we often talk about the environment of the late 60s through the early 80s as stagflation. Uh, inflation was increasing at the same time that economic growth was actually slowing down, so you had the worst of both worlds. While uh, since the 1980s through the early 2000s, mid-2000s, uh, some people called that environment the great moderation, meaning that uh, interest rates and inflation were falling at the same time that economic growth was, was pretty robust, uh, especially earlier in that period in the 80s and 90s. Uh, uh, so that's been a, a, a prominent feature in why interest rates have been falling fairly uh, consistently ever since the early 80s has been the decline of inflation. So inflation is definitely something that moves the bond market uh, and that therefore we need to pay attention to as investors. Another phenomenon on the bond market is called maturity risk premium, and this is also something that Howard touched on briefly earlier. Uh, and this reflects the fact that bond maturities really impact how the bond behaves when interest rates change. Uh, so Howard earlier talked about three-month and six-month treasury bills, which are short-term bonds. Uh, they last less than a year. Um, uh, so they typically do not have a great movement to changes in interest rates because the bond, even if it's a six-month treasury, it's going to mature soon and you can take that money and you can use it, uh, reinvest it at the new interest rate. So if interest rates go up, the value of that bond doesn't decrease very much because you're going to get your money back pretty quickly. On the other hand, a 30-year treasury bond, you're locking your capital up for 30 years. Now, you don't necessarily have to own that bond for all 30 years. You could hold it for a year and sell it to somebody else to, to uh, run out the remaining 29 years, but somebody has to hold that bond to maturity. And so if interest rates drop or increase significantly over the life of that 30-year bond, you have a long time to wait before you can redeploy your capital. On the other hand, if interest rates drop, your bond looks great because you've locked in a favorable interest rate for a long period of time. So the longer the bond yield, or the longer the bond term, I should say, uh, the more sensitivity it has to movements in interest rates. And because of that risk, the more return investors expect to receive uh, for long dated bonds. And we can see that in what's called the yield curve, which is the interest rate being paid at each maturity length for treasury bonds. And as Howard mentioned, we have this unusual situation right now where three month interest rates are actually higher than six month interest rates, which is creating a bit of a kink on the left side of the yield curve here, which is uh, atypical. Normally, you have this smoothly upward sloping uh, diagram that shows you for the longer, uh, the longer the maturity length goes, the higher interest, uh, interest rate that investors are demanding. And these are all treasury bonds, so they all carry the same, uh, uh, same credit risk to the U.S. government. They're, they're essentially identical other than their maturity length. Additional factors that we can look at on the bond side, one is default risk. Um, the U.S. government, at least by convention in the financial markets, is, is considered to be risk-free, so there is no default risk associated with, uh, with U.S. government bonds, although the behavior of the six-month and three-month treasury bills might indicate that market participants don't think so, at least in the short term. But definitely when we talk about things like corporate bonds or municipal bonds, uh, you do get a default risk element, which is the risk that the, uh, the issuer does not pay back their interest and their principal to you uh, when it's due. And we can measure this by looking at something called the yield spread, which is how much you get paid above a treasury interest rate to take on corporate credit risk. And these are 
uh, yield spreads by credit ratings of various kinds of bonds. Uh, now, credit ratings start out at AAA is the, the most, uh, most safe, most uh, advantageous credit rating, and they go all the way down to single C. And looking at a couple of indices here, we have AA, uh, triple B, double B bonds. Uh, anything above double B is considered to be investment grade. Below that, you have high yield or junk bonds, uh, which are, are not, uh, not investment grade. They're considered more speculative. So looking at these various uh, uh, levels of credit risk, you can see that at every point in time over history, since these indices started in uh, 2007, the lower rated the bond, the higher the interest rate people are demanding to, to assume that risk, which is intuitive. The more risk of loss, the higher the return you're going to command uh, in order to undertake that risk. But we can see that the level of yield spread that investors demand varies over time. It was very high in 2008 and 2009, obviously due to the economic uh, uh, crisis at that point in time. People wanted a lot of compensation to own risky bonds. Uh, another way to put it is that people were selling those risky bonds, which drives up the yield, as we've talked about earlier. Uh, we had another little blip um, after the financial crisis in 2011 and 2012 when the Greek situation was unfolding in Europe although it was certainly much, much lower in magnitude than the, the 2008 financial crisis, as we can see. And then we had another uh, scare in the high yield bond market in 2015 and 2016 uh, because of the sell-off in energy and other commodities. Those companies are big issuers of high yield bonds. And so the, uh, the weakness in the energy sector had a, a fairly significant impact on the high yield bond market. And you re may recall your portfolio manager discussing that factor with you a couple years ago when high yield performance was fairly challenging. Currently, we're in what we would call a narrow spread or a tight spread environment, meaning that investors are not demanding large yield premiums to own uh, uh, corporate bonds, uh, in particular, more risky corporate bonds. So that's something that we pay attention to in, in terms of how much we're getting compensated to assume various levels of credit risk. A final uh, uh, category of, of risk that influences bond yields is called liquidity risk. This is maybe the least observable and, and most uh, hard to understand risk. Uh, and, and in particular, I don't think markets, uh, frankly, do a great job of, of interpreting it. A good example of liquidity risk is to compare uh, a liquid market like the US stock exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange, where you can uh, pull up a, a ticker uh, like Microsoft and you can watch the stock price change during the day. And if you have some Microsoft and you want to sell it, you know pretty well what you're going to get when you go to sell your Microsoft stock. Uh, your block of stock hits a broker. It might hit the open exchange if you're selling a lot or if the broker wants to execute the transaction that way. But in any case, the market is liquid. It's transparent. You know what your Microsoft stock is worth. On the other hand, if you own a very esoteric kind of bond uh, that doesn't trade very often, uh, you might not have a good sense of what you could command for that bond if you wanted to buy or sell it. Uh, it's a lot lonelier of a landscape when you're trying to buy or sell illiquid securities. Uh, and the price that you think you can get may not be at all the price that you do get, especially in a stress scenario. So liquidity risk tends to exacerbate other kinds of risk. So for example, in 2008, liquidity dried up for some forms of bonds that are, that are less transparent, certain parts of high yield bonds uh, and, uh, and structured credit. Uh, so when we look at these risk premia, the first three factors uh, are the most dominant for investment grade, high, high grade bonds like treasuries and high grade corporate bonds. So the risk changes in the risk free rate, inflation assumptions and maturity risk premium really dominate those bonds. Uh, on the other hand, things like high yield corporate bonds, structured credit bonds, even high yield municipal bonds, they tend to move uh, uh, significantly on assumptions about default risk and to some extent liquidity risk. Although, as I mentioned earlier, liquidity risk is something that's a little bit harder uh, to predict. But definitely, you know that if you own a, a very thinly traded bond, it, it might be tough to get out of it. So you might command more of a, a return for owning that bond. So that's a look at the bond market and factors that drive it. And we can see those factors play out if, if we come back to our efficient frontier and our scatter plot of asset classes. So. Uh, the three-month Treasury bill uh, uh, is a fairly pure reflection of that risk-free rate. There's very little uh, liquidity risk. There's very little maturity risk. There's almost no default risk. Uh, uh, so it, it carries a fairly low interest rate because you're not assuming much risk. On the other hand, when you turn to intermediate-term Treasury bonds, still low credit risk, but you're taking more of that maturity risk phenomenon by owning longer-term bonds. Uh, 
uh, stepping up to long-term corporate bonds. There you have an increase in both that maturity risk and in, and in credit risk because now we're talking about corporations rather than the U.S. Treasury. And finally, high-yield corporate bonds uh, adding to that, uh, that uh, uh, default risk or, or credit risk premium. And so there you can see a very nice progression in bond yields as we would expect. Uh, but you can see that stocks uh, still sit way beyond uh, the bond uh, asset classes that we have defined here. Uh, so let's turn to stocks and, and analyze why stocks uh, are so much higher risk and higher return than bonds. And, and some of you may have an intuitive grasp of that, but let's take a look at the factors that drive stock returns. And frankly, stock returns are a little bit harder to decompose into neat categories than bond returns are. We can slice and dice bonds maybe in, in, in more uh, transparent ways, but we'll, we'll take a look at stocks nevertheless. And we're going to start that by looking at what we call capital structure, which is how companies raise money. Uh, they can, uh, in broad terms, they can raise money by issuing various kinds of debt, or they can do it by issuing stock. And if you're a stock owner, you literally own a share of the company. It's, it's called equity because you own equity in the company rather than the, being a bondholder. And that's important for economic reasons. Uh, the various levels of bonds that we show here vary in terms of their uh, seniority during a uh, uh, liquidity or li uh, liquidation or bankruptcy situation, rather. So the, the most secure bonds are senior secured debt, ranging down to junior debt. And the higher you are in the capital structure, uh, the first uh, or the earlier you get paid in terms of a bankruptcy. So if the company has to liquidate senior secured debt, it's paid off first. And if there's money left over, uh, we turn to senior unsecured debt and so on down the stack. So the higher you are, the lower risk and the lower return you should expect uh, for that investment. On the other hand, if you're at the bottom of the totem pole, uh, uh, you are the lowest priority in bankruptcy and therefore you bear the highest risk and you're going to expect the highest return for doing that. Uh, uh, for stockholders in a bankruptcy situation, usually a company will file for bankruptcy because its assets are less than the value of its liabilities and therefore there is zero uh, equity value left over. Usually there's negative equity, meaning that somebody else has to take a haircut as well in a bankruptcy situation. So uh, the fundamental reason why equities are so much more volatile than, stock, than bonds, but also higher returning, is that you are taking uh, this risk of, of, uh, of being at the bottom of the capital structure. The other, the benefit for that is that equity owners usually have uh, exclusive voting rights or control of the company. They elect the board of directors. They get to vote on things like mergers and acquisitions and dispositions of assets. And they also have a claim on the company's earnings uh, beyond what the company has to pay out on expenses and then pay out in taxes, pay out interest to bondholders. So any profits that the company makes over and above its expenses are uh, at the disposition of the equity owners and they may, uh, they may get those as dividends or those, uh, those earnings may be rolled back into the company as what's called retained earnings. So the, the equity gets to control what happens to those retained earnings. Uh, so that's an idea of, of how uh, the equity uh, slice gets positioned in capital structure. And we can also look at stock risk as a combination of two other factors. And this gets a little bit, uh, a little bit detailed, but, uh, but bear with me. We can think of the risk on any individual stock as a combination of what we call idiosyncratic risk plus a sensitivity to systematic risk or broad-based economic risk. Um, by idiosyncratic risk, we mean uh, a risk factor that's specific to that one company. So let's look at, let's take Boeing as an example. Uh, the risks that are specific to Boeing, uh, you can think of a lot of them, but, but things that might affect that company and not others could include a product recall, a natural disaster, an accounting scandal, a merger that didn't go to plans, a product launch that failed. Uh, anything like that uh, would be specific to that company and wouldn't necessarily impact others. On the other hand, uh, you could have events uh, that generate systematic or sensitivity to systematic risk, uh, uh, like an economic recession or, or uh, uh, other broad-based movements in the economy that would impact not just Boeing, but all other companies. And so I picked on two stocks here to look at their sensitivity to systematic risk or broad economic risk. Uh, I picked on Procter & Gamble and American Airlines. And we can actually measure that sensitivity uh, via a factor called beta, and beta measures how correlated that stock is to the broad-based market, the S&P 500 in these examples. Uh, so Procter & Gamble, they sell consumer products, they sell uh, medications, they're, they're usually what's called a consumer staple company, meaning that people buy their products in, in good times and in bad. And so their beta is relatively low at about 0.56, which means that if the S&P 500 is up or down five, uh, 1%, we would expect Procter & Gamble to move about half a percent in the same direction. So it has less sensitivity to these broad fluctuations than the, the market as a whole. Uh, 
On the other hand, American Airlines is what we would call a consumer discretionary company. Uh, you have the choice of whether you want to fly or not. You might, uh, if things are bad, decide to postpone a vacation. Companies might send their workers on fewer trips. And so uh, the, their sensitivity to broad economic events is higher. Um, you can mitigate that idiosyncratic risk by diversification, by owning more stocks, which dilutes your exposure to an event on any one company. On the other hand, systematic risk is not diversifiable. The more stocks you add, you're not really diluting that risk. You could choose lower beta stocks that would, that would have less risk. But overall, your portfolio beta should converge to something like one, where you are uh, as exposed to those broad economic events as the overall market. Uh, so financial theory says that you should be compensated for taking that systematic risk, but you should not be compensated for idiosyncratic risk because it's easy for you to get rid of it by diversifying your stock portfolio. And that's another reason that we, we uh, uh, advocate diversification here at Coldstream. So uh, the relationship between that beta, that sensitivity factor, and the, the premium that you get paid to take stock risk can be uh, uh, summarized here. Um, this is a very famous equation in finance. It was first proposed by a researcher named William Sharp, who actually won the Nobel Prize for it in 1990. It's a foundation of what's called modern portfolio theory. But that relationship has come under a lot of scrutiny recently because it doesn't do a very good job of predicting how stocks actually behave, the returns that you actually get out of a stock portfolio. And in fact, we found uh, over the years since uh, William Sharp proposed this in the 60s that there's a lot of other factors that seem to explain as much or more of actual stock returns. So we'll look at those uh, briefly as well. Uh, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French uh, in a 1992 paper discovered two other factors called the value premium and the small cap premium uh, that they found have been, uh, been demonstrated across markets and across time in a consistent way uh, that, uh, that influence stock returns. So for example, the value premium, uh, uh, Howard mentioned uh, value versus growth stocks earlier, uh, historically, if you slice the market into five different court, uh, quintiles based on uh, book to market is one indicator of, of growth versus value, value stocks have historically significantly outperformed growth stocks. Uh, the, the right end of the scale is the, the most cheap stocks, the most value-oriented stocks. The left side is the most expensive or growth-oriented stocks. And you can see the significant difference in uh, average return over the 1951 to 2015 timeframe. So value historically outperforms growth pretty significantly. Uh, the same thing occurs if we look at small cap stocks versus large cap stocks. Uh, uh, over time, uh, small cap tends to outperform large cap by an average of about 3.5%. You can see that that outperformance is not stable over time. It varies a lot, but historically that's been the trend. Now there's a lot of research investigating whether these factors continue to, uh, continue to govern in the markets, but, uh, but most researchers think they do for various behavioral reasons. Uh, so those are two additional factors that, uh, that you may have heard of and that have been pretty well established by research. Another one of them uh, uncovered by Carhartt in 1997 is the momentum premium. And this looks at how stocks uh, do based on their own recent performance. Uh, so if you slice the U.S. stock market into another uh, group of five quintiles based on recent winners versus recent losers, you can see that the recent winners tend to continue to outperform, while the recent losers, the, the, they have much lower uh, returns on average. So if a stock is doing well, it tends to continue to do well, and if it's doing poorly, it tends to continue to do poorly over short to medium uh, uh, time periods. So this is another uh, uh, factor that has, uh, has been pretty broadly adopted in, in various investment management theories. And finally, another uh, premium that's more recent, uh, the low volatility premium, takes another look at that beta factor, that sensitivity factor that, uh, that we looked at a moment ago. And if you slice the market up by beta, by those high sensitivity stocks versus the low sensitivity stocks, based on that traditional financial relationship, you would expect that the more sensitivity you bear, the more economic risk you bear, the more return you should get. But in fact, that may not be the case. Uh, if we look at the, the golden or the pale yellow bars here, that's the return for each quintile versus, uh, based on beta, the highest beta on the left and the lowest beta on the right. And you can see that, that that really doesn't change from one quintile to the next. It moves up a little bit in the middle of the page, but nothing like the relationship you would expect. Uh, what does change is risk. You can see that the highest beta stocks on the left, the, the brighter or the, the golden yellow bar, the, the uh, risk of those stocks is much higher than the lowest beta stocks on the right. Uh, so it looks like you're taking more risk in high beta stocks, but you're not getting any more return. Uh, 
And so the risk, uh, the return per unit of risk, which is the, the uh, gray diamonds, is called the Sharpe ratio. And you can see that the lowest beta stocks, although they don't earn more average return, they have a lot less risk. And so that uh, return over risk ratio looks a lot better for, for low beta stocks than it does for high beta stocks. So that really throws the entire traditional Sharpe model into doubt. Maybe beta is really not a very good predictor of, of stock performance, and maybe we need to fall back on these, these factors and others like them. So this is an ongoing and, and active area of research um, uh, among financial economists and, and financial professionals uh, and, uh, and an area that uh, has a lot of controversy and, and active, uh, active investigation. So how do we use these factors here at Coldstream? Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the basis of these is that these factors have worked in multiple markets over multiple decades. We looked at U.S. stocks, but researchers have found similar trends in other markets. Uh, on the other hand, there are time periods, they could be long time periods, where any given factor may not work very well. Howard mentioned earlier that uh, this year, growth stocks are outperforming value stocks, and that large cap stocks are outperforming small cap stocks. And those are not the relationships that historically the factors would predict, but, but again, that's a, a relatively short time period. So uh, another example is that value was a severe underperformer during the dot-com bubble of the late 90s when growth was really dominating. Um, uh, factor definitions and explanations are controversial. So how do you define a large cap versus a small cap stock? How do you define momentum and measure it? How do you define some of these... Um, these factors can really uh, influence the results you get from the research. And, and whether they are, are true or whether they hold in various kind of markets is, a, as I mentioned, an active area of research. Um, nevertheless, uh, the financial community has responded, and we are seeing increasing numbers of products that are targeted at factor investing. Sometimes this is called smart beta strategies. Uh, we've seen a number of mutual funds and ETFs being created that, uh, that uh, attempt to exploit these strategies, but it's not always as easy as you might think. Integrating multiple factors in one portfolio can be tricky. If you're trying to tilt a portfolio to both small cap stocks and to value stocks, and maybe you have a momentum component there as well, how you add those up and incorporate them in one portfolio uh, can be more challenging than it might seem uh, to make sure that you get the blend of the factors that you want. One other item that we've noticed is the, a lot of these new factor-based strategies have uh, higher fees than traditional index funds. Uh, and, and a cynic might say that these are just new ways for uh, investment managers to package strategies so they can charge a higher fee for what seems like a newfangled and interesting investment concept. So if the factor uh, does occur historically, uh, but the fee of the fund is higher, you might, uh, you might wipe out all that excess return in the fee that you pay to the fund manager. So that's something that we pay a lot of attention to when we're selecting uh, selecting investments that we use in client portfolios. So the bottom line is that we think factors have some uh, good ac uh, academic support. Um, we think that they're worth considering when we're constructing portfolios, but they are just one of many, fact one of many other uh, considerations that we take into account when we're assembling client portfolios. Uh, we do have uh, several funds that do use factor tilts. We also use them in our uh, individual stock strategies on the dividend growth side. So if you're curious to hear more about factors and how we use them, please, uh, please get in touch with your uh, relationship manager or your portfolio manager, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to, uh, to have that discussion with you because, again, we think it's a pretty interesting area of finance right now. So with that, we're going to conclude. We, uh, we appreciate your attention on today's webinar. Um, if you'd like a, a replay, one will be distributed uh, uh, over the next few days. A replay link will be sent out to you, uh, or if you'd like to pass that along to somebody who couldn't attend uh, live today. So once again, thank you for your attention. Uh, please have a great weekend. And if you're in the Northwest area, I hope you're enjoying this beautiful summer weather that we're having. Thank you again.